Startup grind starts in two minutes. Okay, come on in. Come on in. Come sit right at the front. I wanted to also say a big thank you to, to Miguel and a and, um, big thank you to our sponsors. Um, so Nefoscale, Bruce, please say hello to Bruce, as well as Same Page. And thank you also to Maxim and the folks at Pivotal Labs uh, for hosting us tonight. Um, and then if, is there anything else we want to announce? No? Thank you for coming. No? no? I'm Denise. I, I'm, a, I'm part of the Startup Grind family. So Startup Grind, I've been involved with Startup, I've been a member at Startup Grind for a couple years, and I just kept coming to these events and loving this the talks. I've been an entre entrepreneur and in involved in the startup space for a long time, but I always thought it was a great opportunity to get to know and meet you know, other people aspiring to build companies and building great companies and learning from experts uh, who've done it before. Um, and just kind of had a soft, spar soft spot in my heart for Derek and the team here. So I, in the last company that I was running communications for, I became the first ever sponsor and partner for Startup Grind. Um, wrote, wrote Derek and the team their first check last year. Um, and then when I left that company to go do other things, I, I you know, aligned with Derek and helped uh, grow the, the sales and marketing team at Startup Grind. I think when I started here, we had four or five chapters, and now I think we're over 60, which is amazing. So we're doing these events all over the world. Um, so if you know anybody outside of San Francisco in another city, in another country, where there isn't a Startup Grind presence, please spread the word. The best thing that you can do to pay back Startup Grind is to talk about Startup Grind with somebody that you know that's passionate about startups and entrepreneurship. So please pass the word along. We're always looking to grow more and more chapters. We have a couple of inbound requests for chapters every single day. Um, so Derek and the team are scaling that. Um, so without further ado, I'm actually going to introduce our guest tonight, um, the founder and CEO of Zendesk, Miguel Spain. <laughs> um, so after an inspirational trip to, sorry, sorry, wrong one. <laughs> I'm going to use the new one. Um, Mikhail Svein is the founder and CEO of Zendesk, a provider of cloud-based software for customer service, a Dane turned San Franciscan. Um, he and the two co-founders of Zendesk moved uh, the company f uh, to San Francisco after starting it in Copenhagen in 2007. Um, and Zendesk came from a really simple idea to make customer service software beautiful and available to companies of any size. So now um, over 30,000 companies use Zendesk to serve more than 200 million people worldwide, which is awesome scale. Um, so welcome to Mikkel and also to um, Perry Gorman, who is a founder of Archively. It's a little low. Hi, everyone. Hello. How are you all doing? Thanks for coming tonight. Um, we usually like to get a little temperature check of the room and get a sense of like who's here. So how many people are founders? Wow. OK, how many people are engineers that are also founders? <laughs> OK, yeah. And how many people, um, how many people are early stage, like pre-funding? And how many people are like seed stage, later stage? OK, cool. It's good. And how many people are hiring? OK, so let's get this show on the road. We, we, we have actually been lucky enough at Startup Grind to have Mikkel as a guest previously. Um, in, uh, was it in Sydney or, or Melbourne? In Melbourne, right? Okay. Um, so we're going to try and change up the content a little bit, but also kind of get him to tell us some of the gems again. And um, let's, start with, let's start with the story of Zendesk and how it got started. and your team in Copenhagen, and the thought process around, you know, why Zendesk? Yeah. Is this on now? It is. No? Yes. <clears throat> Great. Um, so first of all, thanks for, thanks for having me. Um, I, did, I did Startup Grind back in, in Melbourne, back in, remind me, was that October? No, this year, February? Um, <laughs> And uh, it was, that was my first time I met kind of the Startup Grind uh, community, and uh, that was a very, very fun experience. Uh, they drink a lot more beer in, in Australia <laughs> <laughs> very quickly. Um, so uh, I, I was, I'm, I'm happy to, to uh, do uh, 
uh, this event too. I, 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 I try to speak a lot and connect with the local startup communities. I think this is the first time I really talk to the startup community in San Francisco, where I very much feel as like I'm an outsider here. Um, when I talk to startup communities in Europe and Australia, they want to they wanna learn from me how is it being a foreigner, a foreign entrepreneur moving to San Francisco and learning about the startup community there. And that's, that's the story they want from me. So I'm not sure what you can learn from me because you're right here in the middle of it and know the local startup community and the local tech community a lot better than I do because I'm still a guest here. I'm, I've only been here for three years. But it's longer uh, than I've been here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, but so I'm, I'm the funny accent. I'm from uh, Copenhagen, Denmark. Uh, I'm uh, uh, I started Sendesk with my two co-founders, Morten and Alex. In uh, we launched the product October 2007, and uh, bootstrapped the company for the first couple of years until we started pitching U.S. investors and finally deciding to. Uh, to move to San Francisco in 2009. Um, so that, that was the early days. A couple of us had a background in the, the customer service and support industry where we worked as consultants in kind of implementing uh, systems, technology, and also business processes for companies to use these kind of tools. And I think this startup was a pure reaction to the quality of the tools that were out there, we, we felt they were horrible. They were extremely expensive. It took forever to implement them. It took forever to build the business processes. And the funny thing was that companies were willing to spend a lot of time implementing, a lot of money implementing these systems, but they always put the lowest paid employees in front of them and said, okay, now you deal with our customers. It's just <laughs> such a weird world back then. Like, um, so we just thought this can, be, this can be done better. Let's build a better product because this doesn't make any sense. We were kids. We were child, childs of the internet generation. You know? we, we grew up with, with, with our computers and with the web and we're used to using systems like the 37 signal systems and Salesforce and so on where you could get like this instant gratification and you know, everything was running in the cloud. And I think we just said like, okay, let's bring this industry up to date. Let's, let's put it out there. Let's make a beautifully simple system. You could sign up, try it online. You could roll it out on, yourself, on your own. You didn't need an army of consultants or anything like that and, and, um, and, and do everything yourself. And so that was very much the premise. Let's just, let's just build a system for our generation, for ourselves. Kind of going back to that, you also said that you developed it for a year before you put it out. Did you... Did you build it off of your knowledge of the industry, or did you do a ton of customer development on the product before you shipped it? Obviously, from I think the three of us, I think we we talked about it and and start and, and 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 worked on it for like almost two years. I think at least a year and a half before we finally shipped it. So it was a pretty well baked and finalized product before we shipped it. And I think that that's very much a testament to how lousy that industry was. Like, no innovation happened at all. So over those 18 months, nothing changed. <laughs> and that is, a, that is a luxury that you, you don't find in a lot of industries. But basically, nothing changed over those 18 months. So we could take our time to develop this product and, and launch it. And that's probably a luxury that you don't meet in Silicon Valley. Like, here you have to fail fast, and there's a lot of attention about what you do. We could fly a little under the radar, take our time, and, <laughs> and build this product and launch it when we felt that it was fully baked. Um, and it was fully baked. Like we had everything, uh, everything implemented. Of course, the product has grown a lot since back then. But it was really a system where the whole onboarding, where the whole, all the workflow, all the business process logic, all these different things work, the reporting, all these different things. Uh, and even like we built our own billing system so we could charge for it and recurring payments. And we had all of that uh, 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 figured out and uh, spent maybe a day building our marketing website. So very much the Silicon Valley model on its head where you spend more time on your marketing website and then you build a prototype quickly. Um, but so, so that was a little bit our luxury and, ma and maybe it's been our luck that we could do that in, in, uh, in Copenhagen. 
Is it because of Copenhagen, or do you think it has more to do with the fact that you had such deep domain expertise? So uh, domain expertise, because it, this is business processes. You know, this is business process. This is how people work and, and interact and workflow and so on. So it's not, it's not, you know, it's not taking photos or sharing photos. It's not something you can invent. Like you have to, you have to work with business processes, distill them, and then wrap them into a new kind of beautifully simple uh, wrapping and, and, and do that. So you, of course you, have, you need the industry knowledge. Um, uh, so it, it's different from, say, a, a consumer product. But it was also just a, a it's, it's very much just a, also a, a result of who we were at that time. We, we were free guys and we financed this by taking various, various consultants, uh, consultancy jobs and, and, and you know, I had a million kids in that period and we just had to kind of, we just had to do things in our pace that fitted with our lives. And, and we were just super, super fortunate that we were early in kind of saying that this is the way the industry is growing. So when we launched our product, we were ready and the market was ready, you know. So then the next question would be talking about customer acquisition and sitting in Europe doing that. Um, and you mentioned previously how important Silicon Valley startup customers had been for you in the fundraising process. How did you, how did you get started with customer acquisition and what would you... What would your recommendations about like, what you learned from yeah. that to other because cu customer acquisition is a, a, a topic that people really yeah. care about. Yeah, and, and, and of course, like with so many startups, you have to build your product for your customers and you have to focus violently on your customers and acquiring customers. Like it is the basis for every business, getting customers and getting them to pay. You know, of course there are there are all these odd businesses that, you know, you know, there are the Instagrams where, you know, I don't even, like, was there any, I don't know if they ever had, like, a monetization model or a business model or anything like that. Of course, there are these exceptions where people can do things very differently. But, you know, for the rest of us, you know, for the real population of the planet Earth, like, you need to, if you build a business, you need to think about how to make money and build a, a, a healthy uh, revenue uh, stream. Um, so we were very focused on about getting customers, but we, we, we were also very interested in running a very lean operation. Like, we, we didn't have any money, so we couldn't hire a bunch of salespeople and sell it. Like, so we really focused on building a system that was beautifully simple, instant gratification. You understood immediately what you could do with the product and how it could benefit you, and then just make it super easy to acquire and pay for. Um, so that was our business model, you know, making the customers happy. Because also, a happy customer tells another customer. And, and that was our business model, you know, getting them happy. So, so we did some weird stuff. Like, we, I, m I remember we advertised on the deck. Anybody remember the deck? The, it's an it's a advertisement network on certain blocks. Tiny little, tiny little ads. And they used to come up on, uh, like, these, uh, like, laughing squid and, you know, signal versus noise and that group of Mac block or whatever. So like these very different places and we advertised our help desk, our support system there. It was just the weirdest place in the world to advertise a system like that. We broke all the norms and we had a freaking Buddha, you know, <laughs> as, our, as our kind of our mas mascot. So everything was just strange about it. But people, we suddenly we realized that we, by making things so simple and speaking a different language, suddenly we could sell to customers, to companies that didn't traditionally buy this kind of stuff. They didn't know they could buy it, they didn't know they could afford it, and they didn't know they could actually transform their business and their customer operations by uh, having such a tool in place. So we reached, we reached a completely, we built basically a, a completely new market for our software. Our first customer was a small Irish uh, technology telco company up in in Dublin, Ireland. The second customer was a chain of gas and convenience stores in Texas. <laughs> um, and we, just, we do, were just successful in attracting kind of a completely different type of clientele. And, and we didn't focus about our near market or anything like that. We just focused on getting it out on the internet and, and thinking internationally and being internationally. So for example, 
I'm just talking it. <laughs> no, great I, interview. I love it. It's uh, <laughs> <laughs> I quickly realized is that great customer service for a company that is a customer service company is important. <laughs> like um, free founders I, I, arguing with the customers is not a good idea. <laughs> So, <laughs> we'll, we'll put this under lessons learned category <laughs> question. <laughs> but um, we, um, we found out that during the trial phase, if you can get the customer that tries the product, if you can get them to engage with the person, there's a much higher certainty that they will convert into a customer. So, we created this persona, Jennifer Hansen. She still exists today. Um, that basically reached out to our trial customer and says, that said, told them like, hey, thank you for trying Sendesk. I, I checked out your website, it's great. Uh, or something like a little small personal note and let, us, let me know if I can help you with everything, with anything. And um, we, we, we found some students in Hong Kong to help us kind of automate that process. So every time we got a trial, they checked out their website, checked out the person, put together a little personal comment and put it into the system, and the system sent out emails to start engaging with our customers. Uh, of course, they, they also responded to some of the inbound traffic, but we, that was mostly sent to us so we could kind of deal with the actual kind of questions and issues and so on. Um, so that like, it, it was very kind of, we, we tried to think internationally from day one. It was a completely coincidence that we started out these operations in Hong Kong. I had a friend there who had moved there with his wife, and he was very bored and basically said, can't I do something for this company because it sounds like a lot of fun. So he helped us set up those, those operations, and that has been very much the cornerstone for a lot of our business. Now those operations are not located in, in, in Hong Kong anymore, but you know, it's, again, another coincidence that kind of had defined the, the destiny of our... What, what are the advantages and implications of having... I mean, clearly you're, you're Danish, so having a... Clearly. Clearly. Um, <laughs> having a, a dev center in Denmark, which you do, like, makes sense. But what is the, your experience managing a company with people in remote locations, and, and how do you... <laughs> risk manage that so uh, like until we moved the company here to San Francisco we were like a completely virtual company uh, we didn't have an office we worked out of my co-founders Alexander's his loft um, and it was always a little awkward when we came in the morning like was that girl in there or not and but that <laughs> you know that's <laughs> that's very much kind of how it is as a startup and and but so until we moved here um, we, we were completely virtual, and we weren't on the pay. We, hadn't, we didn't get the regular paycheck or anything like that. It wasn't until we got here that we became like a real company. And um, the year before we moved here, I was traveling like half the time. I was always traveling back and forth because so much stuff was going on here. So many customers are here. So much business development opportunities. So much access to capital and so on here. So I just, I traveled back and forth all the time. So I remember when we set up shop here, I was like, fuck that. <laughs> I'm never going to travel again, ever. How's that working for you? <laughs> so um, we, let's build the team, the core team right here. Okay. Let's hire everybody here. And all the remote workers, let's get them here. And, and, and embed them here in the organization. And let's make sure that every day we sit in the same room get shit done, look, can look each other in the eyes and make quick decisions. So we got everybody here, and I think for a year, for more than a year, I didn't get near the airport at all. Um, that has since changed, yes, because now we are a global company. As soon as we got like a critical mass, I felt that we had mature processes and so on, we started looking at building up satellites. Because that... How big are you now? How many people? We're almost 400 people today. And we've been here for... Uh, Three and a half years. Yeah. That's fast growth. I mean, how, how is that hiring process of scaling that? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I love asking those questions. <laughs> um, no, hiring is like, when we came in 2009, the, the climate was very different. Uh, that was after the credit crunch in 2008. Uh, and um, like there was a 
very different vibe here in San Francisco in the Valley. I remember we, uh, we went in, we, our first office was on 410 Townsend, um, and th that building was more or less empty. Uh, we moved in, Yammer moved in, Eventbrite moved in, TechCrunch moved in, Playdom moved in, a bunch of other startups moved in. Suddenly it was like a very, very hot building. But um, we got, I think we got it at $17, $18 per square feet. I think that building is now $55 per square feet. Um, so things have changed over the last three years, including the housing market. <laughs> um, but... Um, and it was also different uh, to hire uh, talent back then. It was, it's, it's never easy here because there's always great companies hiring, but it was easier. And um, I think, again, another little coincidence that made it easier, at least for us, to hire a great team initially. Like, I, I would probably not have been able to, I would probably not afford to if we had created the business today to hire that same great team because salaries has gone through the roof uh, since, since then. So again, we were fortunate in building out the business um, when, the, when, the, when the economy was um, not as good as, as it is today. Um, but hiring, of course, it's hard. You need to get the process in place, have great recruiters, have a great team. It, a company is all about the people, uh, as you know. Um, and, and how about competing with other companies? And what do you think of Aquahires as as a solution? What, I mean, how I do you? It's, 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 you know, it's crazy, you know. And it's 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 it all happens here within this little, you know, the vacuum of of Silicon Valley. And 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 you know, you start getting used to it in these crazy amounts. And but it's like sometimes you have to get out of San Francisco to really understand how crazy it is. Um, so I think we have also made the decision that, that we cannot be too dependent on that. So after 400 people, I think we have 250 here in San Francisco, 150 are outside of San Francisco. So we set up a dev center in, uh, we set up a dev center in Copenhagen, where I'm from. Um, and again, this was just because we were Danish. Startups in Denmark knew about Sendes because that was the company that made it. We, we just had a great recruiting platform in Copenhagen, so we easily hire like 20 engineers there. Um, and since then, we've, we, have a, we have a shop in London, we have like 50 people, primarily sales support, enablement, uh, some of these services. We have some back office functions there. We set up a data center in Dublin, so we now have a European data center, important for European customers. And we have uh, set up, uh, we have an engineering center there too. We have our uh, APAC operations in so Melbourne. That's, that's oh, oh, in, in Melbourne. In, in Melbourne. And uh, you just set up Tokyo. Yeah, still so very early days in Tokyo. What are just for and Berlin for, yesterday for companies that are are maybe more valley centric to start? I mean, what are the things that a company would need to have in their mind when they think about going global and international, and and even going when you start going into non English speaking? Yeah. Markets like Japan. I mean, these are all. It's a big, I, big, these are big, all for you, yeah, otherwise yeah, yeah. English speaking. Correct. Big, big, yeah, yeah, yeah. Big, big question because like it, it, stuff like that is complicated. I think it's easier for us today as a generation to think internationally. Like we're probably all kinds of nationalities in here, and I think the great thing about Silicon Valley is that you don't meet a lot of uh, at San Francisco is that you actually don't meet a lot of people from San Francisco. How many here are from San Francisco? <laughs> one. <laughs> like person. one. Excellent. And that just makes Woo. it. Like an amazing place to build a company because like there's such a networking culture and an open, embracing, diverse culture here that makes it really, really easy for foreigners to come in and be successful and like having their families be successful too and so on, which is super important. So Silicon Valley is San Francisco a fantastic place. It's the best place in the world to build a startup. And I don't I don't know if you like if you realize that how lucky you are to build a startup here. If you have tried building a startup anywhere else, you will know how privileged you are here. You are being taken serious here. You have direct access to capital. You have a whole ecosystem. You are an industry here. You, like every, everywhere else in the world, you are, you know, cute. <laughs> it's, it's oh, you, oh, you're working on your computer. Well, that is great. Uh, you, you're, not an, you're not 
being a, a, a tech, tech startup is not an industry anywhere else in the world, and it's amazing to be here. It makes, it makes the pace high, it makes innovation crazy, and it's, it's just a, a vibe and an opportunity that we should all embrace and just celebrate every day because it's a fantastic opportunity to build a startup here. Like, when you build your, when you build your business, like, if you build it for Silicon Valley, you will fail. Um, like, so this 99 per 9 the customers, will fail. Like, who, like, if your customer exactly. market is Silicon Valley tech exactly. companies. Yeah, because, like, of course, there are these art mans out with these exceptions and so on. But, like, for, for the rest of us, if you build your, your product for Silicon Valley, you will fail. But if you get early traction in Silicon Valley, because Silicon Valley and San Francisco companies are early adopters of different types of technology, you will know that if you can get adoption here, you're onto something. But you need to prove that outside of Silicon Valley too, or else you will never be able to build a business. You know, I, I, you know, I make, make things a little black and white, but the principle of that you need to build a business for the real world is important. Also, the, the thing that is, though is, is interesting about getting customers here is that for me, as a foreigner who has absolutely no network here, who has a funny accent, and all of these different things, like raising money in the valley is almost impossible. They can't back channel me. You know, they can't, what the hell is this guy? And what's the, that, that language? And where is Denmark and Netherlands? What is it? And, um, but if suddenly you can get a few um, Silicon Valley companies and San Francisco companies to use your product, Suddenly, they can back channel you. Their portfolio companies are using you, and suddenly, you're on their radar. So in terms of raising funds, like getting local companies to use your product is a really, really good idea. Who was your first Silicon Valley company, that you, customer that you had? So I think the first like, high profile was Twitter, uh, Script, Yammer. How did, you, how did you get Twitter as a client? When, we like, didn't, from where we, you were. We didn't get customers. We just built it and people came. And just crazy they found ways. it. Yeah. Okay, so. um, it's a good question. I should once, I should, how they first heard about us is a very good question. Find out. Um, <laughs> woo! How many here are you, Sendesk? Nice. Thank you. <laughs> I told him I was going to start using Zendesk, and he said, like, can, how would you like to pay? <laughs> It's good. It's 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 a good. Um, it's good to be like that. Revenues are good. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's talk about customer service as as a whole, as an industry, about how much it's changed, about how it can really impact an early stage startup, and and the importance of of the the customer relationship. Yeah. You said something great in. Um, you said success is not defined by the ability to have no complaints. It's defined by the ability to deal with them. Yeah. Um, like, customer service, it's, first of all, it's, it's like sitting in a call center or in a service center or a, a customer center is really, really hard work. Like, having to deal with customers that are unhappy, that are dissatisfied, they can't figure out the system, or don't understand their bill, or can't get through to the person they want to get through to, and like getting, having to deal with that all day is really, really hard work. And if anybody has tried that, they know what I'm talking about. You burn out relatively quickly. Um, but it's one of these things where, it's one of these things where like getting up in the morning and exercising, that's also pretty hard, you know? <laughs> Nobody really likes that. Getting up and it's raining and then running five miles or 10 miles or whatever, it's brutal. That's torture. But like once you get into the rhythm of doing that, you realize how good it is for you. You know, you realize how good it is for your body how good it is for like mental capacity, how good you eat better, you sleep better, your sex life is a lot better. Um, just getting into that rhythm of getting up every morning and doing it, is, you realize how good that is for you. And that is the same thing with customers and customer service. 
Like it's really, really hard to get into that rhythm of embracing your customers and putting yourself in the same boat as them and, 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 and really taking them seriously and holding them really, really close. It's such hard work. But when you start doing it and you're doing it right, it's so good for your business. Suddenly you understand your customer so much better. You understand what you need to do with your product. You understand what you need to do with future features. You understand what you need to change and what you need to do better. And you make your customers so much successful and they will tell the world about you and you will be successful. <laughs> and you will have better sales. Uh, <laughs> Note, last comment. So if... Um, you know, the way that customer service had been, I mean, you really, you, and, and you really came out with this before everybody sort of expected a response on Twitter for every complaint, I mean, right? I mean, the, the customer service was definitely not there. Keeping up with customer expectations in the general market, I mean, how, how, do, you, how do you guys innovate? How I think it's, it's important to understand that a lot of us has probably forgotten about that, but just five, ten years ago, customer service was very different. It was all about, it was a cost center for the companies, and it was all about <clears throat> where could you place your customer service so it was as cheap as possible. Um, and, you know, if you lost a customer, well, too bad. If you cre created a great relationship, well, that was good because then they would probably come back. Um, the voice of the customer has changed dramatically over the last five or ten years. Now a great relationship is not just a great relationship with that customer, but a great relationship with that, with that customer and all the colleagues and friends and so on of that customer. Your customers are now your primary marketing channel. They are also, once they get unhappy, your worst enemy because they will tell everybody about that horrible, horrible experience they had with your product or with your customer service and influence a lot of people. So the voice of the customer has never been bigger than it is today. And it's more important than ever, especially for you know, people like us. Like we don't, like if we want to communicate with our bank or with our you know, telco or whatever provider, we don't, uh, don't want to spend time going to the freaking website and finding a contact us form and then getting a re response within 72 hours. That's not good enough. Like we want to be right where we are and ask for help, whether that be on you know, Facebook or Twitter, you know, or just like shouting out in the air, <laughs> we, want, we want help and we want it now. So co companies today, they need to embrace all these channels there are for like, these, all these communities out there and all these social channels. They need to embrace them all and be super, super responsive when stuff is going on. And that's, of course, at the impossible task so that's why you need great technology to be able to scale that experience. And, and I think that is, that is what Sendesk has proven is possible. Yeah. And I think that is what, uh, what, what, uh, what drives the market today. Okay. Well, if you could do anything differently and like give people one piece of advice and say, I wish I had done this, what would that be? Um, so... Uh, I think like when you, when you build something and when you run quickly, you will stumble and you will fall and you will fail and you will constantly have to get up again and keep running and all these things. So you make, if you don't make mistakes all the time, you're not running fast enough. So you just have to embrace all these mistakes and not ignore them, but live with them and deal with them. And that, 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 that also expands to our customer service philosophy and how we build our product. That, as you said before, like you're not defined by your ability to, to um, not have mistakes or to avoid mistakes and avoid failures. You are defined by your ability to deal with that stuff when it happens, because it's gonna happen. If you do stuff, you're gonna make mistakes. If you are successful, you will stumble along the way. Um, so, no, I will not change anything. If I have one piece of advice, <laughs> from, from my experience, raise money when you don't need to raise money. And when you raise money, raise twice as much as you need. <laughs> On that note. <laughs>
Let's open the floor for questions. I'm sure, do we have a, do we have like a process for this that we're doing, Derek? Is he even here? Okay. Um, why don't um, we just have people come up here, over here, and we'll do the mic, yeah? Okay, um, you mentioned that you build a product and they did come. But you also mentioned that you guys used DEC and probably you were doing some other inbound marketing yeah. uh, techniques. So what have you done in the beginning when you like one year from the beginning <coughs> and like and now? What's the difference? Um, so I think we, we, we um, back then all everything with AdWords and so on was still very new. Uh, so we just we experimented with a bunch of it. But it was an, an extremely limited budget like our total initial marketing budget was like $50,000, you know? So like we had to be really, really creative with every dollar and think outside the box. Um, so one of the things that works really well, uh, or worked really well, I'm, I'm not, maybe things are different today. Sorry. We build, we build a lot of integrations. For example, um, we didn't have time tracking in Zendesk. Um, and we, was, we weren't sure that we wanted to have time tracking centers. So we built integrations with some great time tracking products out there, like uh, Harvest and, and some of these other tools. And so they wrote about us on their blog. We wrote about them on our blog. And then their customers got exposure to us, and our customers got exposure to them. We did the same thing with the 37 Signal products. We got them to write a little bit about us on their blog. We did that with a bunch of companies. And that kind of um, exploring that community of customers that are already kind of subscribed to using SaaS products and so on uh, exposes you to very kind of uh, uh, very hot prospects. Um, so that was, that was another way, a more creative uh, business development way of, of, of creating leads and, and acquiring customers. Question was, in, in is he the, doing that, yeah. or was someone on the team doing that? So me personally? <laughs> no, so, no um, well, yes, we did it, like, as a team. Uh, we, we, now we have a completely different, since then, uh, like, we have experienced that uh, the community is building these integrations, and we benefit really from that, and other companies are building integrations to us, and that's great. Um, but initially, we kick-started all of these integrations. We built them ourselves. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, there's, a, there's a story oh. uh, that I would uh, like for you to share with the audience. Um, and it has to do with your pricing strategy. <laughs> early, early in your company's history, there was a time where you, you're at an inflection point where you had to kind of Re reorient your pricing strategy, and it created a small subset of unhappy customers. <laughs> and I was wondering if you wouldn't share two aspects of the story. One, a very important pricing strategy, <laughs> you know, moment for the company, which was critical to your, you know, continued success and driving revenue. But also the unique touch that you put on the, the feedback and share that with the audience. And I think that's a <laughs> testament to the culture that <laughs> Mikkel and his co-founders have created. Um, so this was back in, I think, 2009, uh, relatively shortly after we moved to San Francisco. Um, and uh, we changed our pricing structure. <clears throat> and like, uh, as, you know, if you don't know that, like, you need to, when you build a, a, a a B2B product like this, like you need to have a great, you need to have a great pricing structure where all kind of the, the smallest, um, most sensitive price sensitivity, uh, price sensitive of your customers can kind of upgrade in small increments. And as uh, the bigger the customers get, the kind of bigger steps in increments they can uh, absorb. Um, and we have, over time, optimized our pricing structure more and more to to fit that. In, in 2009, we made a, a, a relatively big change that was combined with uh, a bunch of new functionality and features and structure in the product. 
uh, that we have been working on for a long, long time. Um, and, and basically what we did, like we sent out this long email to our customers explaining all these new things, explaining them how, what they paid now and what they would pay in the future if they stayed on that plan or if they wanted to change to another plan, what they would pay then and like kind of like just a very long email that nobody read. <laughs> and they were like, what? You know, <laughs> is this getting more expensive? Fuck you. And, and like our customers got crazy with us and, and we thought we really explained it. Like we thought we really, we thought we really made our case and we thought it made a lot of sense. But, um, but today it's like how much you read your emails. I don't read my emails. If I can't read them on my iPhone, like in three lines, I'm not reading them. So like when you communicate with your customers, you have to, you, you, you can, you have such, you have so, so little place and so little room to tell your story in. And we just failed. We just made it way too complicated. And what our customers saw was just that prices went up. Um, and, and, and we had to, we were shell shocked for a day because that was the first time ever we got like negative feedback from in, in, in that scope from our customers. So we had to, you know, we had to back paddle. We had to tell them that we were sorry. Like we, that we, there was a trust between us that we had kind of misused. We had exploited and, and we just had to back paddle and say sorry, you know, forget about it. You, keep you forever, you keep the price that you have today. <laughs> Don't ever think about it again, please. Um, and, um, that, you know, I don't know, I think it's, I think the hardest part of that, that period or is, is that it's, it's hard for your, it's hard for your employees suddenly to realize that all your customers maybe don't love you anymore, you know, and, and like, you know, uh, it, it, I think there was a level of shell shock, and it was it was our first kind of public disaster, and and uh, and uh, it makes people think about what are we doing? Are we doing good? And is it right what we're doing? And so on. And and like f fixing that quickly is important. So we we did the only thing we could do, and 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 just say like retreat, like forget about it. Uh, we're sorry. We 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 really messed up, and and. Let's forget about this and, and see if we can reboot our relationship because you know your, your relationship with your customers is very much like a relationship with your better half. You know you make mistakes from time to time and and and, and it's hard to avoid mistakes and and sometimes you really disappoint each other um, and you have to figure out a way of of looking each other in the eyes and say like we I screwed up like can we can we please start over because I'm I'm really sorry. So, and you know how hard it is to say, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, and as a reminder <laughs> to all of us, we, we got a lot of bad feedback and we made t-shirts of all of those comments. So, we can remember every single day. At some point, it scales to more people, and I'm wondering at what point did you guys define your culture and say, like, this is who we're going to be <laughs> as Zendesk, you know, the personality, and this is the kind of people that we want to attract to yeah. our company. Can you talk about that? Ah, it's, it's, culture is such a, a tough phenomenon, like, um, it, it's true that you, you, your early culture is kind of defined by your founders, because, you know, we have the biggest voice, and we, you know, everybody's looking to us for answers and so on, but, um, and I think it's, uh, I think it's very, very important for a company to make sure that founders stay committed and enthusiastic about the opportunity and stay in the company because that makes the company a lot stronger. Uh, so my two co-founders and myself are still very active on the executive level in the company. Um, it changes and as we talked about before, it's, it's all about the people, the people you hire. I don't think you create culture like that. You know, culture is a reflection of the people you hire in the company. So you have to be really good at hiring people. And you know, you have to make sure you don't hire assholes. <laughs> no, but like, you know, it, it spreads like a cancer within the organization. And suddenly you have politics and all these different things. Um, so it's so important to avoid that. Like having people in your company with really good values and and like our very 
my first investor told me, like, if you could choose between two people, one of them would kick ass. He would get shit done. He would take your company to a new level. He would, you know, go out, go to get all these clients, all of that stuff, but he would be an asshole. Would you hire them or would you hire somebody who wasn't an asshole and couldn't, would never be able to perform at that same level? And I think early on, when you don't have money and everything is hard and so on, that's a really tough choice because you want to be successful. But that's where, that's where, you, have to, that's where you have to think long term. Like you can, you can always figure out a way of getting the revenue, but you can never get rid of the asshole. Our senior director of PR. It's like, this is on video. This is, yeah. I'm sorry, Matt. <laughs> I'm sorry, Matt. <laughs> sorry. Hey, Mikhail. Um, I saw your um, show with uh, This Week in Startups um, with Jason Calacanis. I loved it. And I really like the little Buddha. And uh, I feel like I could totally use the service. I just don't know what exactly is it you guys do. Okay. <laughs> and how it works. Uh, I have some idea. I feel like people maybe get to know the business a little bit. Then you train them. Then maybe they come to your company for a day or two to learn how it works. And then they start providing email support and phone support and stuff like that. But I'm, I actually don't know how it, how it works. Would you mind letting us know? So how Sendesk works, what the product is doing? Yeah. So for instance, we have an internet, consumer internet you know, product. Um, if we wanted to get some customer support, yeah. uh, customer service, how, how would that work out? Yeah, so, so the basic principle around Sendesk is that if you are a company, you have customers. I, or most of you have customers, <laughs> sorry. But, but like once you start having customers, they will reach out to you one way or the other. They will uh, send an email to you. They will give you a call on the phone. Or, or use your website or your forums or your community or whatever. We make, it, we make it possible for companies, or we make it possible for you to route all these interactions, all these inbound traffic to info at companyname.com and support at companyname.com to a system that then, uh, based on the business rules that you want to define or can live with our basic vanilla business rules, Make sure that these questions get rooted out to the right people. And so everybody in the company can see who deals with these things and what did we reply. Or you can uh, uh, ask somebody else to reply to it and they can send you a personal note and you can escalate it back to you. So it's just a workflow for managing all your customer conversations and share that workload in your company or between a, a team. And we can provision a phone number. There's a PBX, a call center built into the system. So when you sign up for Sendesk, we give you a phone number, and all phone calls to that phone number also get routed to the system, and you can take them through your browser or your phone, and the call is getting recalled, recorded on a ticket and transcribed and all of these different things. Um, so we just make sure that you have a fantastic record of all the customer interactions that you have with your customers. And then we may give you a community and a knowledge base and all these different things that you want, an FAQ, a tool for managing all of these things and using them in your customer service. So you can put that on your website. And then we give you a lot of insight and data about your customers that you can then use to grow your customer base and learn a lot more about them and build a better relationship with your customers. As an engineer, I find it very, very inspiring that you succeeded off the, off the merits of what you do. But how much of your growth do you attribute to basically who you know? And were you surprised by that? How, how much of our growth we can attribute to who we know? Well, when you got to Silicon Valley, you said you didn't know anyone, but then you met people. And how much of your growth was due to that, your networking? Uh, um, well, that's a good, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very honest answer. Uh, well, I, I think it's, so, it, uh, one of the things that we're trying to do that is a little bit unusual for a business software company is that we try to build a very strong brand uh, that resonates with people. So we have, we have a very friendly, a little quirky kind of uh, uh, 
style, uh, our videos are a little different, um, and you can go to our website and see all these things, and we have, we have a Buddha with man boobs as a mascot, and, um, and, all these, and, and, and I think we're like, we really, really try to build a strong brand that, is, that resonates with people, and that is very unusual for, for a, like a, a, a business software company, like you don't see Oracle or Microsoft or you know, uh, uh, a lot of these traditional business software companies doing that. It's very formal and it's very like ROI and blah, 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 these different things. Whereas we try to, reson we try to find a brand that resonates with people. Um, so I think, I think that, that building a strong personal connection with people is critical for our company. But I, th I, I think we try to do that through scaling our brand rather than uh, through individual or personal interactions. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. When's the next event? Do you want to announce anything, Derek? Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you, by the way. Well, I just want to say thanks so much for coming. We've had 250 of these events around the world in the last couple of years, and you are the first speaker who's ever spoken on two different continents. So that deserves some sort of medal or something. We're going to get you a trophy. That's huge. What? I don't have a medal, but I'm going to get one. <laughs> and, um, and it might have man boobs on it, like the Zendesk guy or something. Um, but no, thank you so much for coming. And uh, we got Jessica Livingston from YC next week. And then we're here, back here at a Pivotal Labs uh, for Ali Partovi, the founder of Code.org, in about a month. And then we've got uh, Vinod Kosla, and we've got Bill Maris from Google Ventures, and then we've got uh, Hallie. Teco, thank you, from, uh, from Rock Health. So back here in August.